Good morning, everyone. My son is an engineer, and if he would see me coming to a blockchain conference with an old-fashioned few sheets of paper where I scribbled my note, he would be mad at me. <laughs> but tech change forces today especially in the payment systems, uh, everyone to reassess its business model. And that is not only true for the incumbents of finance, the banks, which sometimes seem to be a little bit slow moving, but also the case of non-bank financial institutions. But it's also the case for central banks, whose business models are affected by technological change and which have to assess whether their tools, their instruments are still fit for purpose or whether they will have to change. The whole thing is of course even impacting our societies because the uh, security of investors or consumers is the security of people who vote for politicians who represent us they also will be interested in defending their sovereignty of their nation or respective their region, as we say, see it here in Europe. And therefore, when we talk about regulatory change, I think we always talk about three, four different basic elements. The one is, is regulation coming in too early and then it might stifle innovation or might it come in too late and on the back of scams and fraud, which would have as a consequence to undermine the trust of people in new innovative products. Is regulation too intrusive at the beginning and it would again be a element that does not support innovation? Or is it too lax and we will have the same thing as having the absence of regulation? And then there's a third element, that is a distribution of responsibilities between the private sector, which is the driver of innovation in our societies, and basically is the carrier of liberty, or is it the public sector, which also has the rule, a rule as an anchor for stability in our systems, and the rule to act also for the part of the society which are not at the forefront of innovation and at the forefront of change. And that is, what is the role of the public sector, the private sector? Is there a competitive role? Is there a complementary role? Is there no role at all for the public sector? which I would say is an extremist view, uh, which nowadays uh, shows that it has its limits. But before you make any progress on this, I think you have to agree on three things. The first is to make an assessment and to agree of where do we stand now? Uh, where is the situation, how is the situation in terms of uh, the available information? The second element that you have to agree on the basis of this uh, agreed analysis would be what are the objectives of any regulation? And there again, I think it's good to know where do we stand now? What are the objectives of hardwired regulation, of soft regulation, because we have a bit of everything right now? And then the third part of my speech will be the competition or the complementarity between the public side and the private side. And for this, I will focus on uh, what is called central bank digital currencies, uh, which uh, back in 2017, when I was still in office, I preferred to call a virtual representation of cash. But at that time, we did not talk about uh, uh, 
crypto uh, assets, we talked about uh, virtual currencies. So that was a misnomer, and that's why we also changed the public word of virtual representation of cash into central bank digital currency. Before I go into the assessment, how I would propose to see where do we stand, let me say some, a few basic truths or principles. First, it is not technology that manages risk. It is people who use technology. Second, our monetary policy, which is a public mandate given to public agencies, is operating throughout the business cycle to smoothen the business cycle beyond the electoral mandates, and that's why it has been given independence from politicians. But it still needs to be efficient to operate through part of the financial system, and that happens to be the banking system. And that's the reason why also the banking system as a whole is under the surveillance of central banks very often in terms of financial stability of the system, but also individual banks are supervised and are much more constrained in what they can do, what they cannot do, than other parts of our economy. And third, I think before we move forward, we always need to better, better understand the risks and the benefits of innovation, the welfare effects of crypto assets, the drivers and mitigants of risks. And in order to do that, we need to have proper data, orderly information. We need to improve our reporting standards to assess the risk for individuals as well as for investors, but also for st financial stability. Of course, when regulators start to come in, they always try to start what, from what they know. I think that's quite human. And what we know is quite, I would not say very well, but quite well is the risks that permeate the financial world, and uh, especially the banking system. And we see that part of the risk that uh, is in the crypto world is comparable to the risk that is in the traditional financial world. So, since it is early morning, uh, I thought it might be good uh, to start with what I would call a rather critical view of uh, crypto assets, and I draw on a speech by the Vice President of the German Bundesbank that was given, I think, uh, some six or eight weeks ago, Claudia Buch, and to uh, assess the different risks as she sees it in the crypto asset world. First of all, the shortcomings of information. She said that uh, there has been a lot of price manipulation on self-reported trading volumes, on unregulated exchanges, and also in relation with illiquid markets. If you look at the amount of the volume treated in the crypto world and also the number of transactions, the share of frauds and scam is quite higher than you would have in the comparative traditional world. Concerning the leverage risk that we always also look in into the traditional world, uh, we see in the crypto world that collateral is often consisting of unbacked crypto assets which in themselves have no intrinsic value and on top are highly volatile. Collateral change are widespread in the crypto world. Very often we see loans that are used as collateral for getting loans and sometimes these loans are even connected. 
So that's really like a merry-go-round uh, where the one who is uh, lending is organizing its own collateral. We see widespread use of margin trading that increases volatility. We see lending of crypto assets like 20 times the value of collateral. Some exchanges offer leveraged derivatives, which leverage up to 100 times. I also just recall what we saw at uh, FTX, where we uh, observed lending of client funds to affiliate entities that were heavily engaged in margin trading. So far for leverage. Next week's risk would be concentration, also something that is particularly plaguing the crypto world. In traditional finance, the concentration risk is limited and on top under close surveillance in order to avoid conflict of interest. But some crypto conglomerates offer as uh, crypto asset service providers simultaneously brokerage Trading, lending, custody, clearing, and settlement, or even some more. Some of those have headquarters that are based in unregulated offshore territories, which very often are uncooperative. No apparent liability is appearing as there is no transparent governance structure. And if it is done in a decentralized way, only global agreements would be able to have a overview over this uh, situation. We see also a highly concentrated world as what concerns market capitalization platforms and activities. Stablecoins disclose their reserves only on a voluntary basis mostly, and some of these statements are not audited by a third party. Both the existence and the composition of reserves cannot always be verified. Part of centralized, off-chain crypto asset activity, therefore, by itself, took the initiative to move to fully decentralized finance, where everything is on-chain. But monitoring and governance of decentralized finance is in the hands of a few founders or developers. Only a few functions is true decentralized and it is not surprising that during 22, I have no figures for the present year, but in 22 the decentralized finance decreased in volume quite a lot. Because we also have seen in decentralized finance a very high concentration of validators which can potentially have a negative impact on security. Recent bankruptcies have shown a high interconnectedness and consistent pro-cyclical selling as a high exposure to settlement risk and operational risk in a small number of blockchains. Then finally, a word of liquidity risk. Liquidity depends on investments, finally, uh, in uh, money markets. As crypto assets like money market funds have no access to central bank liquidity, at least not in the Euro, Euro area, they depend on banks finally for funding. Metrics, therefore, for systemic risk will, in the crypto world, and I repeat now, will have to focus one, on size, two, on complexity, three, on interconnectedness and common exposures, four, on leverage, and five, 
on substitutability. That means what is the cost for society if one of those services would go belly up and you will have to substitute it in order to maintain a service, for example, in payment areas in certain regions. That also has a, a welfare risk. Where do we stand today in terms of statistics? Only a few internationally active banks have crypto exposures, which to the total amount to 0.013% only of total banks' exposures. Also, the ECB uh, mentions that there is uh, not a very high take-up of crypto assets, and it is highly concentrated. Then I look uh, to investment fund, there I see a, a smaller, uh, a higher share of investment funds uh, being active in the crypto world, but all of them are alternative investment funds and they all have net asset values be below 100 million euros. I always speak in euros. But this compares to 60,000 investment funds in Europe. And their total net asset value amounts to 18 trillion. So by and large, one could say that there is still not a very high size, and therefore the risk to financial stability, at least in Europe, seems to be measured. But the risks truly exist, as uh, has been shown, and they need to be monitored. And that is why the Eurosystem central banks have aggregated at the level of the Bank of International Settlement Innovation Hub in order to create a Atlas uh, observation center, which is to develop an open source platform with information on market capitalization, on economic activity and international flows of crypto assets. And in order to do this, obviously, there needs to be done a minimum harmonization of reporting standards in order to have comparable information. So that is the first stage where we stand on gathering information where we are far from being complete. Let's move now to the second part, that is regulation. In April, the European Parliament, as the first major jurisdiction, moved towards having explicit regulation on the market in crypto assets, MICA. The uh, Council of Ministers' uh, vote will follow and it is expected that the entry into force uh, might be uh, before the summer recess or early September. But even then, this will not enter fully into force because you need uh, the secondary uh, legislation, level two acts, as we call it in Europe, uh, in order uh, regulatory technical standards in order to be fully implemented. And these regulatory technical standards, which will be proposed by technical agencies, um, will have 18 months before the entry into force. This basic regulation is complemented or will be complemented by a so-called DORA, or which stands for Digital Operational Resilience Act, and the second legal act concerning a pilot regime for the technology DLT, Distributed Ledger Technology. I would add that another piece of legislation will be published in the coming weeks, and that is legislation that will enable and limit the issuing of central bank digital currencies, and that is uh, legislation concerning legal tender in Europe. What are now the objectives of such regulation? The self-declared objectives are first of all to have legal certainty, which is the basic of all legislation. We see right now that in Europe, uh, some countries have a bespoke regulation, other countries have no legislation at all, total freedom. Different institutions are in charge of overseeing or su surveilling with different uh, amount of competencies. And this created a huge uh, unlevel 
playing field. Uh, this also allowed for circumvention of certain rules. Uh, it allowed for regulatory arbitrage. And therefore, it is not surprising that the Commission felt the need to come in on the basis of an article of the European treaties, which is Article 114, which stands for internal market. In order to have a true internal market to develop in Europe, one needs to have a minimum harmonization, and this is the objective, first objective of this regulation. The second objective is uh, the support of innovation. And innovation also needs a deep and broad market. And that's why um, the support of innovation needs a legal framework, but which is proportional. That means not over-intrusive, but which allows for accompanying innovation without each time uh, reinventing the whole framework. The third is, uh, well, it, with this uh, support of innovation, innovation is not a means in itself. Innovation always means that there must be a benefit to our citizens. And uh, the benefit to citizens in innovation is to have more efficient systems, faster systems, and to have access to finance to a broader swath of population than is presently the case with the traditional banking world. The fourth objective, it is mentioned by the Commission, but it is not exactly what uh, they focus on, because everything that has to do with central bank digital currencies, they left out of this regulation, because it belongs more to the central bank world uh, or to national competent authorities, and that is financial stability. And especially with the emergence of stable coins, uh, if they would uh, develop, they could easily become systemic, especially if they are supported by big tech with their broad amount of customer base, which they could roll out. They could uh, potentially be a risk to monetary policy, to the way monetary policy interacts with the financial system, the so-called monetary transmission mechanism. And in the end, uh, it could also undermine monetary sovereignty because it could uh, have an effect on the balance sheet of central banks, on the issuing of currency, the amount of currency that is issued and the transmission of the monetary policy signals. Before coming quickly back to Mika, let me also mention that uh, in a few weeks, the Financial Stability Board, the G20 Financial Stability Board, will publish updated recommendations for monitoring crypto assets. And they go into a direction which I had called for already back in 2018 at a speech here in London, that is uh, a segregation of crypto assets in the bank's balance sheet from the core financial system and addressing the risks in the crypto asset market. Also, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision in September last year set minimum standards for prudential treatment, which are to be implemented in the different uh, jurisdictions that are member of this committee by the 1st of January 25. This is a work that had been initiated when I was still a member of this committee back in 2019. This committee is right now looking one stage ahead at tokenized assets, both tokenized deposits but also tokenized securities, the benefits of it, whether there, need, there is a need to have prudential standards, and um, I think uh, they have also made a very important uh, approach in now segregating the different crypto assets in two different groups. Uh, the tokenized asset as well as uh, stable coins uh, will be subject to capital re requirements which are based on the risk weights of underlying exposures. And they are in the so-called group one. All other crypto assets will be assigned to a group two, which 
will have to respect even more conservative capital requirements. Banks' total exposures must not exceed 2% of these crypto assets, and they must even be less than 1% of their tier one capital base. Elsewhere, elsewise, they would have to be backed up by additional owned funds. Come back to Mika. Of course, Mika is also trying to not invent the wheel, but to build on the existing legal framework that people know inside the European area. And that is, uh, first of all, the Anti-Money anti Laundering Directive, which uh, is something very close to the heart of politicians and the European Parliament as well. But also the Payments Directive, the MIFID, the Alternative Investment uh, Market Directive and the Usage Directive, as well as different reports and works that have been issued by the Financial Action Task Force on mostly money laundering and anti-terrorist financing, on work by the G7, but also the Financial Stability Board, and then it also had to take account of different opinions, of which uh, the opinion of the ECB, which when East, uh, Mika was first published, was rather critical. I seldom have seen an opinion of the ECB that has been so critical, but most of the criticism has been taken on board by the Commission and the Parliament. And then there were also the input of uh, the European Banking Agency and the European uh, Securities Market Agency. But let me open a parenthesis here. Beyond MICA, there is also some soft legislation that has been initiated by the central bank world, and that is called PISA, and that is the oversight of payment systems. PISA stands for Payment Instruments, Schemes and Arrangements. And it aims to be soft law, meaning general principles and moral suasion. But it says that it will look very closely in order to have a sound legal basis, to have transparent governance, to have uh, a risk management framework, and especially it will look into credit risk, collateral management risk, liquidity risk, and settlement finality. How? Because you know that in Europe, according to law, settlement finality is reserved uh, mostly to the banking system. And so how crediting the end users and what monetary settlement will be chosen will also be subject to this oversight. There need to be payment system providers default rules, the custody as well as the investment risk needs to be monitored, the operational risk, and finally access and participation requirements which are transparent at ex ante. This oversight framework is not applying across the board but is applying across the intensity on the size and on the market penetration in the euro area of the different providers. PISA covers already right now all the electronic payments like payment cards, direct debits, credit transfer, e-money, but it will also apply to the new instruments like stablecoins used to discharge payments in the euro area within an e-scheme. Digital payment tokens are also included in this oversight framework. As long as the euro is used as a currency, or as long as there is a transfer of value from residents uh, inside the euro area, or to residents inside the euro area, the application of uh, PISA will be there. So, let me quickly finish with uh, regulation, 
Without going into detail of Mika, there are several hundred pages. Uh, basically, there is a requirement regarding the issuance of crypto assets and also of the crypto asset service services that are provided. There will be capital requirements and government's rules. And there is a authorization procedure as well as the supervision of issuers and service providers. Finally, there needs to be an organization of the coordination between the different agencies that are competent. As always in Europe, this is quite difficult to organize the distribution of competence between the national level and the European level. We still have uh, some national competent uh, authorities which will be in charge, but you also have competence uh, that are given to ESMA. There will be competence given to EBA and in the end, uh, when it comes uh, to systemic concerns, uh, the ECB will also have a veto right. There will be reserve requirements for stable, current, for stable uh, currency issuers. For example, they are requested to have a one-to-one -one reserve ratio for permanent redemption rights to holders. There is also a prohibition of serving interest rate as it is considered that this must not be a store of value function but only a payments function. On the other hand, the reserves of those stable currencies will be protected in insolvency procedures. There are still gaps to my opinion in this Mika, but maybe this can be discussed uh, in the panel. Let me say a quick and last word about central bank digital currency. Money, as has been often said, is about trust. Money is also about maintenance of value. But money is also about the respect of privacy. That is why dedicated public agencies, which are not for profit, have been created in order to be given the mandate of doing exactly that. And in most countries, those agencies are the central banks, which on top are independent. Because central bank money is the anchor of our financial system, which underpins our liberal democracies. And therefore, central banks are determined not to leave this to for-profit organization without protection and without rules. There have been attempts to gain foothold in the digital payment space and to anchor trust not in an institution but in technology. Trust tends to be replaced in, by technology in distributed ledger technology, but there is no identifiable, identifiable issuer, there is no claims on the balance sheet, and as uh, the president of the ECB has said in a recent speech, and I will close with that, Crypto assets are volatile, I quote now, they are volatile, illiquid, speculative, they could threaten financial stability and monetary sovereignty. Big tech could present risk to competitiveness in the euro area and the technological autonomy as well. Their dominant position raised concerns over data privacy and misuse of personal information. I should wrap up now, and therefore I just finish by saying, where do we stand? We are at the European area in the investigation phase in July. There will be a legal tender regulation, that I said. In October, the Governing Council of the ECB will decide whether to move from the investigation phase to a pilot scheme, which will last for two or three, two or three years but afterwards uh, only the final decision whether to issue it, to roll it out, will be taken. 
And as I'm told to stop now, I will leave the rest to the discussion in the panel. Thank you very much for your attention. ESV is more than another chaotic commodity craze. ESV blockchain can do more than just be a crypto investment. It can help you get more out of your games, share more of your art. ESV makes more things possible.